Putin, for whatever reason, has been extraordinarily tolerant of all sorts of insanity on the Ukrainian side. And he's now announced that there will be no negotiations with Kiev. So if there was any chance for a successfully negotiated settlement of matters between Russia and uh, Ukraine, at this point, with the Zelensky regime, that's over. And of course, all of this goes back to NATO. And you have to stop and ask yourself the question, watching Ukraine and its behavior, why would we want a rogue state like that inside the alliance? Right. And again, this this belies the the sort of or, or reveals the lie about the alliance. It was always supposed to be defensive. It's been turned into a Trojan horse for American offensive operations. Correct. I don't, I don't know that most Europeans want to sign on for that. In today's interview, you'll hear more about Ukraine's invasion, Putin's response, and how the upcoming U.S. election is going to play a major role in the future of this war. We'll also take an unbiased look at how both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris will handle the Ukraine war. Colonel McGregor does not endorse a specific candidate for president, but instead provides simple facts and lets you make your own informed choice. Just let's join Colonel McGregor in the studio to learn the latest updates from Ukraine. Well, everyone, as always, very honored to have Colonel Douglas McGregor join us here in studio today. Colonel, we have some very complicated geopolitical issues we're looking at right now. And we're going to start with Russia, Ukraine. And the big news right now is Zelensky has confirmed that they are making an offensive move now in the Kurtz region of Russia. And I want to get your take and what you think of this new move from Ukraine and how this war is going right now. Well, first, I think it's important to understand that this incursion into uh, the region that we usually refer to as Kursk, into that area, is not a major military event at all. I think the mainstream media is playing this up as though it's the, you know, the, the German advanced uh, vanguard or something is uh, broken through and will be on the channel in a few days. I mean, this is nonsense. Right. The, the Ukrainian forces that broke through started out with a thousand and then it added another 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000. I think we provided them with some satellite-based reconnaissance that pointed to an area that was very lightly defended, and they thought they could break through. Their real objective seems to have been to capture the Kursk uh, nuclear power plant. That has failed, obviously. Mm -hmm. They did damage the cooling system, uh, but that seems to be uh, under repair, and so there's no danger of a meltdown at this point. And I think it's more of a more of an irritant and an annoyance than anything else. And then, of course, a public relations ploy to try and create the illusion that there's something left in the Ukrainians, that they have some fight in them, and we should continue to sort of throw our money into the black hole called Ukraine. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, I, I don't wouldn't pay too much attention to it, except for a couple of things. We now have some credible reports that the Ukrainians are using chemical weapons. And it's precisely, it looks as though these are 155 millimeter shells, the standard artillery round uh, for NATO, okay. with chemical warheads that contain chlorine gas. Wow. And that chlorine is pretty nasty stuff uh, for a whole range of reasons, not the least of which is when it reaches the ground, it sinks into the earth and poisons the area for years. Wow. So this is uh, more than just the usual mendacity this is this is dangerous and and crazy and of course it it contravenes international law we outlawed the use of chemical weapons a long time ago of course that hasn't stopped the ukrainians and we've already seen them target civilian areas while they were plowing their way into russia again all of this is not really covered in the mainstream media the way it should be that in 1991 when the uh, operations began against iraq prime minister margaret thatcher pointed to, to the nuclear, excuse me, to the chemical weapons in Saddam Hussein's hands. Right. And she made it very clear that if he was contemplating using those, that he could then expect a nuclear response from Britain. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't exclude any possibility at this stage, but I think this is probably the last straw for Putin. Okay. Putin, for whatever reason, has been extraordinarily tolerant of all sorts of insanity on the Ukrainian side. And he's now announced that there will be no negotiations with Kiev. So if there was any chance for a successfully negotiated settlement of matters between Russia and uh, Ukraine, at this point, with the Zelensky regime, that's over. 
Yeah, we've seen um, even CNN's reporting that, you know, Putin vows to kick out the enemy uh, out of Russia as Ukrainians cross border incursion expands to dozens of villages. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't see in mainstream media is the fact that, uh, you know, even a lot of these Russian villages and, you know, the, the brutal warfare, you know, we always hear uh, one side, you know, it's the Ukrainians that are suffering, but there's so many casualties on the Russian side as well and innocent lives being um, you know, torn. I, I know you were familiar with the work of Patrick Lancaster, who's on the ground, you know, covering this and really on the grounds trying to report this war that has, you know, certainly not been going on for two years, but, you know, really started back, you know, well over a decade ago. Colonel, I want to know, what what do you feel, you know, where we are in this war and how long uh, this will continue? I mean, you say this is potentially a breaking point for Russia that, that Putin most definitely is going to respond. Is is this going to be really a turning point, do you think, in this in this conflict? I think it's probably a, a significant event insofar as it has persuaded Putin that he, he has to deal directly with Kiev. That okay. is, uh, he's going to have to launch an offensive that, that goes toward the capital and ultimately removes uh, this regime. If, if it's not removed, then at least it will flee to some other location. And remember, Zelensky has pleaded over and over and over again for a no-fly zone over the area, over Ukraine. Well, that's not going to happen. That's impossible. Right. But I hear uh, in the background in Washington discussions again about creating some sort of enclave for the fleeing uh, Zelensky government in western Ukraine with Lvov as the alternative capital, uh, which is just across the border from Poland. Right. So I think that could be under consideration. I don't know. I mean, these are, it's hard to sort you know, truth from fantasy. And there's a lot of fantasy right now because we're we're in no position to intervene in this conflict. Far from it. We're very focused now on the Middle East with whatever assets we've got. But most of the ground force in the army that can fight is sitting along that border between Poland and Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Russia, and some down in Romania. But it's not enough to make any difference in a collision with 800,000 Russian troops in Ukraine. Right. Um, Colonel, what do you think with the future election we're having here in the United States? I mean, I think we've got really two... Uh, paths that we could potentially go if if Trump does win the re-election, there are all signs point that he is going to be able to you know try certainly try in his best to sort the this war out as soon as possible. You know he has famously said that he's going to you know be able to resolve this conflict before inauguration day. However, if the Democrats are able to win, I think that you're going to go you know probably a continuation of the Biden strategy of just pouring money into this war and you know the continuation of potentially even getting NATO involved at some point. Uh, what do you see the future as far as how this U.S. election is going to play in the future of this war? I think the first thing that's important for everyone to consider is uh, who is surrounding uh, President Trump. The last time around, he didn't seem to grasp the importance of personnel as policy. Okay. And he appointed repeatedly people to high office that did not agree with him, who actively subverted him, and, and frankly prevented him from doing very much that, that he wanted to do. Right. Now, that's his fault. He picked them. And once they demonstrated who they really were, he didn't fire them. So it, it raises serious questions about his judgment. Okay. Secondly, uh, you know, he, he would go to rallies in 2016. And every rally he attended, there was this thundering response. Build the wall, build the wall, build the wall. Right. So everyone's expectation was that based on his rhetoric and, and what was said at the rallies, that as soon as he got into office, he would immediately go after the border, right. shut it down, build the wall, police it effectively. What did he do? He went after Obamacare. I, I think people need to then, as I said, listen carefully, but also step back mm -hmm. and, and judge what happened at the time and understand that what they're hearing may not at all be what happens. Okay. And he still has people like uh, Pompeo within his orbit. Uh, right. Robert O'Brien is acting as his principal national security advisor, whether he'll end up as secretary of defense or something, I don't know. Uh, you have Tom Cotton, uh, Senator Cotton from Arkansas, who very much wants to be president, but certainly is willing to take over the Department of Defense. And uh, he's been beating the drums and leading the charge uh, with millions of dollars behind him from APAC. Right. For war with uh, Iran forever. Right. And all of these people have unreasonably bellicose views towards Russia. Mm. It, it doesn't make any sense. And China, for that matter. Correct. So if that's what you want, well, by all means, vote for President Trump. Right. But if it's not what you want, 
then you need to think carefully about the alternatives. Now, as far as Harris is concerned, I don't know why anybody would pay any attention to anything the woman says. Uh, she's obviously got some smart people writing for her now. Right. But she can't think on her on her own. She can't stand on her own two feet and say anything that makes any sense. She can't present a coherent policy picture of anything. So I don't think... Kamala Harris represents the people who are actually behind her. I think she's just a facade. She's there to convince people to vote for her, but she doesn't represent what's likely to happen. Okay. If you if you re reelect Biden in uh, Harris form, the same people have been bankrolling everything over there to this point. The same wealthy figures, hedge fund managers, billionaires who desperately want our borders to be open, who want to destroy our national identity and culture and so forth, they're going to be running the show. They will continue to fight the war in Ukraine. Now, what will they do in the Middle East? It's, it's anybody's guess, but I don't see them abandoning Israel, con contrary to popular belief. No. So right now, if you look at those two candidates, I'd say that they are two wings of the same uniparty. Uh, one is on the left and one is on the right. Uh, the only man out there who is remotely independent and capable of doing anything differently is RFK Jr. Right. Now, what he's going to do, I don't know. But, I mean, I think he's decided to stay in the race. And I think he is somebody who has got answers. Uh, I hope he gets on the debate stage. If he's on the debate stage with the other two, it, it's a no contest uh, because he's he's studied the issues. He has a grasp on the, on the matter. and. He has answers. The others just have uh, sloganeering and sound bites to offer. Right. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I mean, I, I would love to see RFK on that debate platform. I mean, he definitely should be there. But I, I, I like the one insight that you said is that it's two wings of a uniparty. And that is a problem right now in the United States is very much, you know, we, we know this military industrial complex controls a lot of things in Washington. There's a lot of effort for continuing of this war. I think this proxy war with Ukraine is, you know, the the, own, the whole intention really was to weaken Russia. You know, it was well, all about leveraging Ukraine in, in an effort to weaken it was Russia. More than that. It was uh, basically to destroy Russia and to put right. Russia under control of the BlackRock, which is what's happening in Ukraine right now. Zelensky is selling selling off Ukraine to the highest bidders in the West, BlackRock-like organizations who want to go in there and strip out whatever Ukraine has. I think the idea was, uh, let's defeat Russia and then strip Russia of her mineral resources, her agricultural resources, her capabilities, and then divide the uh, divide Russia into a set of uh, sort of vassal states. Right. It's all failed miserably. There is no chance of that happening. But it's it's interesting that people in Washington would think in those terms. Of course, they dress it up in all this sort of meaningless language about democracy, which in Washington means uh, if you agree with me, uh, you have free speech. If you don't, there's no free speech. So so much for democracy. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how this uh, continues. I mean, um, are you optimistic at all that there's going to be any resolution to this conflict? I mean, do we see this ending sometime in 2024? Are we really looking at America's next forever war that's just going to be this money pit, like you said, a black hole that we continue to send our you know, U.S. tax dollars to? Well, let's, let's keep this in mind. There's a hell of a lot that can happen over the next 90 days. Uh, we may well see a major war in the Middle East. I'm amazed at uh, the ability of the Iranians to restrain themselves despite incredible provocations. I'm amazed that not more has happened given the relentless attacks on Gaza that result in people being killed every day. And people are now suffering with uh, disease and every imaginable ailment that you would expect when everything is destroyed in terms of infrastructure. So I, I don't see how we actually avoid a major war in the Middle East. I, and we are obviously contributing to it because we're sending more and more firepower in that direction, indicating that we don't really care about a negotiated settlement. We're, we're doing what Netanyahu wants. People that talk about a breach between Washington and Netanyahu must be smoking some crack because I don't see any breach. Right. I think they may say that to try and soften the blow, but the truth is that Netanyahu is in control of our armed forces. Right. He's calling the tune. And I think he's going to get his war. Unfortunately, we're going to be dragged into it. How long it lasts is anybody's guess. I, I don't have an answer, but uh, the point is, I think that's probably coming. Now, when you go back to Ukraine, that's a different animal because there is a real possibility that the governments in Western Europe are overthrown. 
that these globalists are sent packing. Right. And you get new governments, new regimes, and they say, that's enough. We've had enough. We want an end to this. I think that's in the offing in Germany. It hasn't happened yet, but I think it's coming. It's well underway in France, certainly underway in Great Britain to some extent, although it looks like they are very much in the uniparty mode. Uh, so they're going to have to expel the uniparty from power in London. Right. God bless them. I wish them the best. Right. What we're going to do is get an education regarding what the armed forces are going to do, because ultimately uh, you know, the French army has always existed to defend the French state, but it has not hesitated to intervene when it thought that the French people and the French nation were in jeopardy or being betrayed. The question is, what, do the, what happens in Great Britain? Again, all of these people have been systematically disarmed. You know, it's why when I talk to various audiences, I point out the Second Amendment which grants us the right to bear arms is ultimately the foundation for all the Bill of Rights. Right. All the other amendments depend upon it. We're armed, thank God. Hmm. Uh, the lesson from looking at Europe right now is that nobody's armed over there, and they hmm. are at the mercy of these governments and their armed forces and police. You know, the police, again, what kind of organizations are they? How much do they care about the people that they're supposed to police? I saw an excerpt from a short comment made by a policeman in uh, Britain, I think somewhere in England, who was saying that they wanted to prosecute Americans who uh, were exchanging emails with people in England on the topic of what is happening and, and theoretically encouraging the English to fight back right. against this uh, globalist movement in, in England. Well, he thinks they should be in jail too. I mean, very shortly, un unless people organize and, and demand it, we're at, we're at risk of uh, nobody having a, a Republican Republican style government anymore in the West. I mean, you, your you know your notion of free speech will be completely gone, and when that goes, we've had it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's wild, and I think going back to the Russia Ukraine uh, conflict right now, what's interesting is you know there's been over sixteen thousand sanctions passed against Russia. Russia has systematically been able to avoid almost every one of them. They've pivoted their economy. They've pivoted, you know, how they're dealing with China and trading. They, you know, used gold as a, as a strategy to avoid sanctions. And the biggest loss here has really been Europe, has been Western Europe. I mean, you look at, you know, Germany, who has built their entire economy on cheap Russian gas. You know, that avenue is gone. You know, the, the, you know, the situation in Germany is very dire. And, I, and it's, uh, it's very sad because I think there's governments around the world, or sorry, governments around Western Europe and have just had enough, uh, and the people at least, uh, but you know, they, their government's continuing this uh, this war. It's just not well. In, not defense, getting good. in defense of the Germans, I would say that historically, all civilizations depend on cheap labor. You can't build a, a modern society without it. Hmm. You know, in the if you go back to the Roman Empire, much of that was built on cheap labor. They called it slave labor. It was slave labor. Right. At some point, you, you have to have access to the energy that is critical to the manufacture and the de development of your country. The Germans need it, and so do we. Everybody does. So I think this is going to stop. In other words, they say, when is this going to end? I think it's going to end as soon as the government falls in Berlin. Okay. I would put it that way. Okay. At that point, a new German government will come to power, and I think the indications are they'll say we need peace with Russia. Right. Now, here, it's, this is very strange, too, because if you look at the Christian Democrats in uh, Germany, they're supposed to be the alternative to the Social Democrats and the Greens and others. Right. Uh, they're talking about maintaining this hostile posture to Russia. I don't think that will last. Mm -hmm. I think the, Amer the German people are going to say, for what purpose? Correct. You know, how do we benefit and what does this do for us? Poland is another one. Uh, Poland, of course, is very confused. The Poles, on the one hand, are, are torn between the past and the present. They want to be uh, hostile to Russia, but they realize there's no future in it. It doesn't make any sense, and it's not necessary. Right. They don't want to be drawn into a war. I think they're also very tired of Ukrainianization. They've got so many Ukrainians in the country, they're, they're turning into an extension of Ukraine in many places, and I, the Poles right. don't like it. Gee, what a surprise. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we should be surprised by that. Right. And again, the whole world is watching us. You know, this is the thing that's so so striking about Europe. The Europeans have followed us blindly for years. Right. I guess if you're going to argue who won hearts and minds after the Second World War, well, I guess we did. The problem is that we've been on the wrong road for 30 years.
And once the Soviet state system collapsed and, and freedom broke out, people said, well, let's do what the, the Americans are doing. Hmm. That, that includes education. It includes uh, industrial development. It includes scientific research, social organizations, societal structures. Big mistake. I think Europeans are going to figure that out. But until they really take a, a decisive turn away from the current governments, in other words, the governments are voted out of office, you get a no confidence vote. Right. Nothing of significance is going to change. But Berlin is still ultimately, I think, the key to everything that happens in Europe. Now, some people disagree and say, well, the French are always the bellwether because they're the first to revolt. That's true. Right. And I think the French in their behavior have made it easier for other Europeans to now stand up for themselves and defend themselves. But Germany is still the keystone in the edifice. And of course, all of this goes back to NATO. And you have to stop and ask yourself the question, watching Ukraine and its behavior, why would we want a rogue state like that inside the alliance? Right. And again, this this belies the, the sort of, or, or reveals the lie about the alliance. It was always supposed to be defensive. It's been turned into a Trojan horse for American offensive operations.